All right, Jonestown. It was supposed to be a socialist utopia, but it didn't really work out that way. Instead, it became the site of a horrifying mass murder-suicide. In November of 1978, 913 people died at Jonestown. So how did it happen? Well, it all started with a guy named Jim Jones, a very charismatic, idealistic, and twisted preacher. In the mid-70s, Jones was the leader of a church called the People's Temple based in San Francisco. He had been a civil rights advocate and inspired a devoted, largely African-American following. People adored his fiery rhetoric and his promise of a society free of discrimination. Ah, but at the same time, Jim was falling apart. There were reports of forced druggings and physical and sexual abuse. So in 1977, as the media attention and the public scrutiny grew, Jones moved the People's Temple to Jonestown, which is a camp they built in Guyana. And by they, I mean an advanced team, including Jim's son, Stephen. By now, Jim Jones had become paranoid, obsessed with nuclear holocaust, and addicted to drugs. The camp that was supposed to be the utopia was now being run like a prison. And there were even reports that Jones was preparing for something heinous, like a mass murder-suicide. Eventually, U.S. Congressman Leo Ryan led a group of reporters and some concerned relatives to Guyana to investigate. Now, their presence aggravated Jones. And when a reporter gave him a note from a temple member who wanted out, well, Jones lost it. The next day, as the U.S. delegation waited to fly home, they were ambushed. The congressman and four others were killed. The killings and suicides at Jonestown started. Jones ordered more than 900 of his followers to drink a punch laced with cyanide. He told his guards to shoot anyone who refused or tried to escape. Among the 900 plus dead, more than 270 children. Now, Jones's son, Stephen, was 19. He was not among the dead. He had actually left with the Temple's basketball team to play the Guyanese Nationals. So on that day, Stephen cheated death and lived to tell his story. Now, even though it's been around 30 years or so, can you imagine how much that still weighs heavily on the mind of Jim Jones' son, Stephen Jones, and he joins us right now. Nice to see you. Mm, thanks for having me. How are things? Things are good. Have you seen the movie? Did you, did you watch it? No. I, when I agreed to work with Tim Wallachuk, the director, um, I told him then that it's likely I would not watch the film because it was so much more about the process and working with them than it really was about the finished product for me. It's just I'm too difficult to watch it? No, it's not that so much. Um, it's r r truly, I mean, frankly, your opinion and impression of the film is far more important than mine. I, I lived it. You know, for a lot of people, and I'm sure you've sort of experienced this over the last three decades, is the, uh, just, you know, the name Jonestown. When they hear about Jonestown and they hear about what happened, it's, it's newsreel footage. It's usually after the fact. Mm -hmm. It's, we all know about the deaths of Jonestown, but what, about, what was life like in Jonestown? Mm -hmm. Well, I was fortunate enough to be there before my father got there, and early on, it was up to that time, the best time of my life. How long was that before? Um, eight to ten months of um, hard work, but mostly working with a bunch of young guys and, and uh, eating well and, and, and seeing the fruit of our labor, building a town for our community, and um, worked long hours, but when we were off, our time was our time and we got to do whatever we wanted. It's your own place, it was like your own town. Yeah, yeah, it was good, you know, we played and worked hard, you know, and when dad got down there, it was it, overnight, it became a very different place. So work went from being a means of production to a means of control and we worked less hours, but it was essentially digging ditches and filling them back up. He didn't want to spend any money. We ate terribly and when you got done, when, when you were off work, your time was his time. Mm -hmm. So a very different environment. And, you know, in the movie that I've seen, and of course I remember my mother talking about the, it all when it happened, it just seemed very much about your father sitting there speaking with a microphone and talking to people and constantly reinforcing his control over them. Mm -hmm. Was that what it was like? Not entirely. And, you know, there was a whole community going on around all of that, but it certainly was his come from. Not, and with my father, I think more than... It certainly, control was part of it, but more importantly was adulation. He was constantly seeking adulation and uh, praise of whoever 
he was with. And in Jonestown, unfortunately, his source became finite. So mm -hmm. he couldn't play for new people because he always had to have somebody new that liked him. Sure. Uh, so the madness escalated because he just kept upping the ante. Um, and most of us were acting like we were good with it. So he, you know, because my father's whole world rested in his perception of your perception of him. So it really didn't matter that one, he knew he was a fraud or whether or not we really believed it, as long as we were acting like we believed it, he was good. You know, the, when you look at how, how all of that played out, I've, I've, in the movie you had said that you knew he was sick. I, I think I've even heard say at a certain point your, your dad was going insane. And did you know what early on, like what was the moment where you sort of had that, that, that break where you went, wait a minute, this isn't right? If I could, I, that's a long, it, it was, I was age 11 or 12 mm -hmm. when the break happened. And there's a website um, that if anyone that's seeking a greater under, their own understanding of this, it's a great website. It's called Alternative Considerations of Jonestown. Uh, Jonestown.sdsu.edu. It's by San Diego State University. Mm -hmm. And I've contributed some writing as well as many other people. And in that, there's one called Like Father, Like Son. And it really describes the break, but essentially it was being taken to his mistress's house and um, knowing that something was going on, which was bad enough, and then um, finding out from my mother that she'd been told all the details of, of what had happened, and that's when I could no longer rationalize his behavior. And, that's, and it was about the time that any teenager mm -hmm. is looking to drag their parent off of the pedestal anyway. So. I had good ammunition at that point. Was it tough for you in that you were part of the process of building Jonestown? And do you sort of look back and, I mean, how do you reconcile your own, because I think you were even thrown in jail, weren't you, when you came back to yeah. America? No, 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 actually over there. Over there. Yeah, because I was trying to protect someone else and those that threw me in jail even, I mean, the policeman who read me my rights was apologetic. And, <laughs> I, and it took three months to have my case thrown out of court. But um, I have, Really, it's important to me to take responsibility for my own life. And I, and I really appreciate the question because I long ago stopped blaming my father. And I hated him when he was alive and for, for years afterward. Um, but, and I spent, I've said before, I, I spent, I did my time in hell on earth. And uh, a lot of tremendous grief, remorse, shame, all of that for, for years. Um, and all of the things that I used to try to, make that go away. Drug, um, drugs. Yeah. Drugs, people, you name it. I, I could turn anything into an addiction and, and a way of numbing out, you know. And, and, and fortunately found a, a bottom. And, and, and that's partly because of my father and, and, and realizing where it could go and, and that I didn't have people around me feeding my addiction. I, I had good people uh, saying, hey, I'm not putting up with that. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and was blessed with a, a beautiful daughter. Um, who, who really showed me how false I was living. Um, did, did you go back when you, you think about that time, I mean, 900 people died around that, did you ever have a survivor guilt, which is very common? Sure, and then even the greater guilt of thinking, well, God, if I, if I had not been deluded myself enough to think that he would never go through with it, mm -hmm. maybe I could have stopped it, all of that. And, you know, that's very complex. Who knows if I could have stopped it? But, but, but yeah, I had guilt, um, and I clearly had responsibility, uh, George. I think that all of us, certainly any, any adult, had responsibility on, level, on some level. And I'm not talking about blame. I'm not talking about trying to pin it on anybody. I'm just saying, you know, let's take our lives back and, and be responsible for our part. And let's face it, we were followed and uh, subjugated and, and ruled by a, a pretty a very sick and an often ridiculous man. And, and, you know, why did we do that? Yeah. You know, you never asked this question of somebody, but in your situation, did you ever think about killing your dad? Because you knew that it got oh, weird? daily basis. Like really <laughs> beyond the way a kid wants to kill his oh, old man? Oh, yeah. yeah. As a matter of fact, uh, we talked about it. And I had to keep my brother at one point from doing it. Um, and the, 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 the rationale or the logic was, you know, he's killing himself anyway. You know, let's, let's just let that happen. Well, because Bad drug problem at that point, right? Oh, yeah, beyond bad drug problem. Um, I mean, if, if folks were, you know, read what I, I shared in, in, in this uh, website, I mean, I watched him get shot up by his mistress and just go to nothing, you know, he could, couldn't speak. He called it a B12 injection. <laughs> that, is, that ain't B12 yet. It's supposed to give you energy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So um, we, because we, we didn't, you know, we, we didn't know how that would play to take him out. And, and frankly, you know, yeah, I was so enraged I could think about killing him. I think that's the one thing I've never really been capable of um, up to now 
you know, really taking someone's life, even my father. But didn't you, I heard a story, and I don't know if this is true, that you, at one point, he had fallen into a swamp and you had an opportunity to let him die. Yeah, what, well, yeah. Yeah, what? Well, the reality is he probably would not have sunken all the way, but I, I really wanted to walk away and <laughs> see him get out on his own, but well, if didn't. If he got on his own, he'd be in trouble. Yeah. No. No, really. I mean, he, we were at it uh, quite a bit. So he didn't take me on much because, you know, I told people I rebelled from this place of royalty because he, he didn't, he, he wanted me really to kind of just be quiet. So he didn't challenge me because he felt it kind of looked bad. And like mm -hmm. somebody who knew him well hated him. Um, but the way I rebelled was so ineffective. It was so much about me and so little about the people in my community. When you got back to the States or back to San Francisco, you know how some people have, if something happens in their family, they have a diff it's their shame that they experience. They don't know how to handle it. What was life for you like when, every, when people realized that that guy who was in the papers, who's, that's Jim Jones' son? What was it like for you? Uh, you know, people have been kind. Even George. back then they were? Oh, yeah. 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 And, and those that haven't been kind haven't been mean. You know, I mean, they've just been straightforward. And frankly, I was really good at getting people to like me. I don't, you know, this apple didn't fall far from the tree, man. Um, so while I was going through all the torment I told you about, um, the hell, I was really putting up a good front, which is so much like my father. And so people that knew me closely were talking to other people and saying, oh, no, he's a great guy. There must be something wrong with you, which is exactly what I experienced with my father. How connected to that time are you today? Um, you know, it's a part of me. George, but I'm really living my life now. I'm, I'm blessed to have three uh, amazing daughters and wonderful people in, in, in my life. And um, I, I will say that because I, I, th I think I've come to a place of understanding and even compassion for my father, I say in the film that I didn't mourn his death, but I certainly have felt sadness for him and I've, I've, I've felt appreciation. And um, so I can now look back at my life and take from all parts of it. <laughs> You know, yeah, boy, when I did that, that didn't work. So, you know, stay away from that. You know, gain, I've gained awareness from it. Um, so I don't reject any of my past, and I'm really grateful for it. Um, every part of it. I, I said to somebody recently that, you know, uh, my life has been good even when it was bad, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, you got out. I got out, yeah. I'm not sure how to ask this question, but when, when significant events happen in history, they're, they reverberate for a while and become part of pop culture, becomes part of the language. I mean, I can't imagine how many times somebody accidentally made a drink the Kool-Aid comment around you, and, and you could, that's what it comes from. Mm -hmm. It has permeated society. Mm -hmm. that's Boy, Saturday Night Live had a heyday. Yeah. <laughs> Were you ever, the first time you saw them do the joke, like, what was that like? I, not just with my experience. I, I think there's a point, you know, there's plenty of things to laugh about and some things we just need to stay away from, you know. Um, I, I try not to take myself or my history too seriously, but um, I have felt that way. Eh, we probably didn't need to go there. How's your relationship with spirituality changed? Are you, are, you, are you a Christian? I heard that you would become a very spiritual man, and I wondered if that was true. Yeah, but I don't equate, equate Christianity and spirituality. I heard it said once that Religion is for people who are afraid to go to uh, going to hell, and spirituality is for people who've been there. <laughs> um, and so, <laughs> that's my experience. Yeah. Uh, and I want to say that I've got, I have had the best influence in my life from other people has been from Christians. So, that works for them. Mm -hmm. um, I believe greatly in, in, in a God, a, a loving and, 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 and all knowing and all powerful God. That's way beyond any religion I've experienced. Nice to see you. Yeah. Thank you for your yeah. time. Yeah. Thank you. Stephen Jones, everybody. We'll be right back.